you will not have improved quality outcomes if you don't include addressing health related social needs and uh, health equity strategies overall within the populations that you serve. And so to me, again, this is about doing what we're supposed to do, which is to deliver high quality care and to have good health outcomes. And so the I think that we're on the path now. We have a strong, um, a strong carrot. And now we have to realize that by implementation. Welcome to Meeting the Minds with Wobot Health. We just got to kick it off by saying that there's a whole lot of research and a whole lot of case studies right now on how improving housing, food, transportation, and other factors drives better healthcare outcomes at lower costs. And that's what we mean when we talk about social determinants of health. I know that it can actually feel disheartening to see that there's so much knowledge expanding about, uh, about the issue, but little in the way of action that we can, that we can visibly see and put our hands on. So why are we here today? It's to discuss a recent major catalyst for action. And that's the Social Determinants of Health playbook that the White House released in November of 2023. The playbook discusses a history of social determinants of health and it discusses funding flows, data interoperability and community organizations that all support this background that's needed for social determinants of health or SDOH to actually work. I gotta say, it is a must read. It's a very good read, but reading it is not quite enough. That's what we, why we brought on Letitia Reyes Nash, who is the principal at consulting firm Health Management Associates. Letitia has led major health equity innovations for the state of Illinois Health Department and Cook County Health, and she serves a broad variety of healthcare organizations today. So, welcome to the live stream, Letitia. Hi, I'm I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, again, just as a reminder, the reason that I say that reading it isn't enough is because Letitia brings to us over 20 years of experience in acting the very types of systems that Social Determinants of Health Playbook is trying to encourage. So let's learn from her. Now, if you're hearing this for the first time and it's after Thursday, March 7, 2024, I'm sorry that we missed you on the live chat. Uh, part of this learning is about the questions and stories that you in the audience on LinkedIn Live right now that you bring to the table. So if you want to keep up with Meeting of the Minds and know when folks like Letitia are going on live, go to wobothealth.com slash meeting of the minds, all one word, and we'll keep you posted. So Letitia, I, I want to start with with why, with your why in, in, in all of this, is if you could boil it down to a sentence, and we're thinking about our audience of leaders at health plans, health systems, and uh, people working on, on that te technological innovation front, what in one sentence would you like, what change would you like for these folks to make after hearing us discuss the ins and outs of the, the new playbook? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's very simple. Um, I believe that uh, equity and addressing health related social needs needs to be a core business strategy and it needs to be integrated into your regular business operations and infrastructure, period. Um, and I think that's, that's the number one thing I hope uh, folks will walk away. This is not a side project. This is your core business. If, if I had a way to flash that on the screen, health equity is not a side project, that would be, a, that, 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 that would just be absolutely <laughs> ideal. Honestly, uh, Letitia, I, I was in the, we, the, the, the Vive conference happened last week, uh, which is a, it's, it's a gathering of uh, healthcare leaders on the, the innovation uh, front uh, with technology as a, as a focus. And there was a uh, panel called are we killing health equity i want to post more about that but it was called are we killing health equity and uh one of the, the folks in the room said we look at all these segments and like organizations want to make sure that they're serving segments uh based on like psychographic and, and geographic factors and everything like that but why do we stop that segment focused approach when it gets to things like uh things around social determinants or underserved groups so that health equity is not a side project really sticks, really resonates. Thank you so much for, for wording it mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So 
going 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 a step further, like there's there, there's probably a whole lot of uh, blocking and tackling lessons learned over your history working in healthcare policy, innovation, strategy, and uh, and the light that's led you where you are now. So would love to hear about that story, uh, uh, why you've chosen this path and, and some of the innovations that, that you're proud of on the, uh, along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, my motivation in, in doing this work is very deeply personal. I mean, I think that um, my, you know, I, I my grandmother um, was somebody who really gave me my first lessons in equity and justice and um, brought me into, um, you know, being an advocate and uh, really being on the front lines of uh, taking action uh, where we saw a need in our communities. And so my uh, my grandmother has really helped shape who I am today and why I'm driven to do the work that I do. And, um, you know, in the work that I've done, you know, some of the thing I mean, some of the things I'm most proud of, um, I think, are you know, working to build policy system and environmental change around addressing um, equity um, across the state um, through uh, work like creating policies and uh, like smoke free, uh, you know, public housing, uh, work site wellness and all these other strategies I worked on when I was at the Department of Public Health. Um, but also um, creating the Center for um, Health Equity and Innovation at Cook County Health and really bringing forth um, kind of the bringing together of innovation, data analytics, and um, action, um, and, and action that's responsive to our community needs. So those are two things that, uh, two uh, just two of the, the things that I've worked on in the past that I'm very proud of, um, but all of it is rooted in um, kind of that um, servant leadership model that I kind of subscribe to in the work that I do that really came from my grandmother. Happy to hear, and, and also, Thank you for, for taking it to a personal level with that too. Uh, I, 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 everybody in the audience, I, like there's a reason that that's, that's bringing you here as well. And I, I think that it's important in the work that we do to not be caught up in all the uh, technicalities and spreadsheets and, and this and that data element, but always reflect back on the personal mission that, that's driven us to, 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 to get into these really difficult uh, cycles that we're trying to break. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's a that's a critical that's critical. I mean, I think every I always tell folks I'm like when I do this work, you know, it's not a group of people, it's my family. It's the people that I live with. It's the my community. You know, I do this work, you know, because it is a part of who I am and 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 it's not these groups. It's me. Um and so I think that's something that is important having that real strong person and, and centered approach and under and also you know my you know i've also have a daughter who's um gone through cancer treatments three times and i understand the complexities of navigating complex healthcare systems and so when i do this work you know i want to make sure we're creating glide paths for success for people in healthcare and i take that very personally because i know what it is to be managing as somebody who has privilege and uh, expertise it's still hard. And so it's our job in healthcare to really create clear glide paths for success and engagement in the healthcare systems and, and making sure people get what they need where they need it. Well, to everybody, to you and everybody, it, it just sounds like that's a, a really powerful fuel for the, the, cha the, the change you're trying to help us all enact. So that leads to, looks like, so we, we have this energy, we have this fuel and we have this purpose and how can we guide it in a way that that's effective? And I think that that's what the playbook might have been going for. The playbook, it gives overall guidelines to things, to very specific things like data practices, funding flows, uh, community health support, and, and that background infrastructure that needs to be formed. All of these things pointing at enabling the type of action that we need for social determinants of health. So can you talk to us about how your clients are responding and, and what the impact is for the leaders that are able to get this thing right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I when I was reviewing the playbook again, you know, the number one thing I thought about is, you know, this is the cliff notes. This is the kind of summary of all the work that's been underway for some time. It's it's not only under this current administration, but it's been underway for many, many years. And in fact, there have been folks who've been doing this work for 50 years around trying to in ensure equity and access for underserved communities. Um, and I think that the the folks that I work with are on the ground and what I it's interesting because what I see is 
you know, the responsiveness to a lot of the federal uh, guidance that's been put out and a lot of the policies that are in place. So um, when I work with Medicaid managed care plans across the country, and, you know, I've had the privilege of reading probably 20 states uh, uh, requests for proposals when they put out for bid uh, the competitive Medicaid programs. And in those RFPs, there's embedded uh, requirements around addressing health-related social needs. They're asking questions about how are you looking at the data, you know, particularly around maternal child health. How are you looking at your data around maternal child health outcomes? What are you doing to address those uh, outcomes? And um, what are those additional supports you're providing for those families to ensure that those outcomes are improved? And so that's just one example of what's appearing in the Medicaid managed care world. And, um, and you know, that is where we're seeing tangible uh, requirements around action that needs to be taken, and then also accountability for demonstrating outcomes and impact. You're also seeing uh, language in some of these RFPs around, uh, one of them uh, was in Minnesota around, you know, what are you doing to co-create solutions with your community to address community needs? And so that's a really different question for a managed care plan to be thinking about of how are you actually solutioning with the community rather than you know creating a program and uh and you know hoping that it works and so that's a change um that we're seeing that's appearing and that's responsive to um some of these requirements that are coming down the line i'm also seeing health systems um the, reacting to the requirements around um screening for health related social needs in the inpatient setting. So that requirement is coming is has come down. So systems are looking at how, what are we doing to screen for health related social needs. And you know, the second piece of, you know, so getting the data and knowing who your population is um is is also um out there. So collecting um SOGI data, so the sexual orientation, gender identity data and race race and ethnicity data, ensuring you have that data, that's the first step. Then the next step is um you know, taking that data and um, then screening for health related social needs and then analyzing that and then coming up with uh, tactical solutions to address those needs. And so we're seeing that um, in the health uh, system space where hospitals are working now to ensure that they're embedding those health related uh, social needs screenings. But then that ha that requires them then to build partnerships and relationships with those community based organizations that are actually meeting those needs. Um, so we're seeing that happen at the health system level um, as well. And then at the community level, we have a lot of work that's happening around the country around uh, waivers, uh, 1115 waivers, which are allowing for uh, partnership around, um, you know, uh, really around um, addressing those social needs. And um, that those waivers are then bringing community-based organizations to the table and those health partners to the table where they're having not com just conversations about, oh, how can we create, you know, a, a program that, you know, serve, you know, uh, let's do a program where we do X, Y, and Z, that's a time limited engagement. No, it's saying, we're going to screen for he these health related social needs. And then we're going to refer this person who has this need to you. And then you're going to get paid for providing that service. And then we're going to find out what those outcomes are. And so we we're seeing that um, happen um, across the country in the waiver environment where these tables are getting set. And what's exciting about that to me is that we have to think about infrastructure that's going to support um, these efforts over time. And it can't just be a side project or a, a small program. We have to have infrastructure that are actually going to, that's actually going to connect these systems that haven't been connected yet in 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 sustainable, durable ways. But doing that in order to ensure that we can um, take the uh, opportunity to utilize the Medicaid payment mechanism to support these health-related social needs. You know, th uh, th thank you for that that tremendous response, especially outlining. Because uh, again, uh, like I talked about how disheartening it might be to not be able to see something happening on the other end of that research, the, the, the action that's taking place. So I love to hear about uh, about the action that that's that's happening right now. But there's a there's another part though that that I think about is that um, there's a lot of opportunity for people like you who are interested in making these th these things happen and have that personal motivation and background. But at the same time, there are people that don't have those modifications. Like it, it, it sounds like 
when, when I was reading the document, I, I got a lot of the carrot, but I'm wondering if, if, if you could go into maybe the, the stick aspect of it too. Uh, like there, we're talking about enabling things that, that uh, the type of change that a lot of us might've wanted to make, but what are some of the things that happen if we don't get this thing right too? Yeah, so I think, so there's a couple things I think on the, the carrot side that I'll just wanna mention is that, you know, we have all these accreditation bodies that are now creating health equity designations like the Joint Commission, like uh, the National Qual NCQA, the National Quality um, Organization. Um, and, you know, there's um, efforts around um, really kind of, dem you know, creating an outline of like, here's what you need to do to be able to build uh, health equity into your organization, whether it's a health system or a health plan. So that we have these accreditation opportunities that are coming forth. And I think that's the carrot side, right? And I think as we're um, moving forward and um, in this work, I think that the, you know, the stick side, you know, around quality is maybe coming, right? So at the end of the day, I, I think it's real simple. You know, we have a responsibility in the healthcare sector to deliver high quality care and demonstrate improvement of health outcomes utilizing evidence-based science. I mean, that's what healthcare is supposed to do. And quite frankly, doing and addressing equity within your strategies is part of that. And so you will not have improved quality outcomes if you don't include addressing health-related social needs and uh, health equity strategies overall within the populations that you serve. And so to me, again, this is about um, doing what we're supposed to do, which is to deliver high quality care and to have good health outcomes. And so the, I think that we're on the path now, we have strong, um, the strong carrot, you know, and now we have to realize that by implementation. And so, but I do think that the moment we, we're in right now, you know, is important in that we have to have the data, we have to know our impact of what we're doing. And um, while I I know that things don't happen in a three to six month period, you know, that's, that's not going to happen for change. It takes time to really unravel a lot of the disinvestment that has occurred with many of our underserved communities. Um, but um, it's important for us to measure and to have the systems in place and infrastructure to be able to demonstrate the impact of the work we're doing. Because in this time, you know, particularly in the demonstration waivers that are happening, we have to demonstrate the impact and and the 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 value proposition through these innovations that are happening. Um, and it's and so we have this moment in time where we've got to we've got to really understand and have continuous quality improvement around the work we're doing so that we can continually improve and make things better. You know, by bringing up the quality angle, it, it takes us right back. I actually went into the chat and I, I reiterated what you said earlier about health equity not being a sideshow. And that quality angle that, that you shared re really helps drive that point home. One thing, one thing that we're getting into, though, we're, we're talking about this carrot and stick. It's kind of sad that the, there is a reason that the carrot and stick has to exist to begin with. The fact that we have to go after and say, hey, uh, serve all, make sure that all groups have equitable access to care. Could you talk about what's been holding us back from meaningful progress down these lines such that a playbook even had to be invented? It, it's interesting because I think the thing that's that's held us back is that we haven't built the infrastructure to support what we need to do. And so when, I, you know, a lot of the work that I've done you know, it, it, when I, you know, was working in um, the health system, you know, and even in the state, it ends up, it ends up being like leader driven work, right? Like, you know, you go in with the, you know, the tenacity and the, the effort and you, and I work hard always to build that infrastructure to support the work when you're gone, right? Like that's your dream. Every time you walk away from a job, you want, you want your work to have durability and you want it to last. And so sometimes that happens, but not all the time. And I think that the reality is, you know, we live in a world that says, you know, in, in particularly in government funding, it's like, okay, here's a grant. We want you to do this innovation. We want you to do this program. And then come up with, I, I, I was thinking about this earlier today. I was like, if I could virtually have everybody raise their hand, like how many people got a grant and they were like, build a sustainability plan, you know, and it's like, we're going to do this really cool thing. We want you to do it and build a sustainability plan. And, and it's like, well, what, what's the sustainability plan? Like there needs to be an investment in these areas and in this work. And so I think that 
that has been the barrier is that we have fits and starts of success, of cross collaborations, of things that are working. And then the money goes away because we have a change or we have a, a, a grant that ends. And so the nice thing I think about the work that's kind of moving forward now, particularly through CMS, and through Medicaid and Medicare is that we're building infrastructure within those systems that will hopefully be durable in connecting the community-based organizations and healthcare together, and that we will have a sustainable funding source. And so, you know, they talk about backbone organization. I remember I was working on a project and again, with that grant where it's like, okay, build sustainability. And it's like, yes, you can have a committee and you can have people meet for free, but someone's got to facilitate. Someone's got to be the backbone. Someone has to, some organization has to be the collaborator and hold the notes and keep it moving forward. And so I think that the work that we're endeavoring now has an opportunity to have that infrastructure built that's needed to have that long-term sustainability, which is different than a grant program, right? And so that's been the challenge is that these fits and starts of great work, um, you know, does didn't have sustainability. And these uh, programs now that those that using utilizing CMS as a catalyst for this gives us an opportunity to build that durability that we really need. So th that's a really powerful answer. O honestly, uh, when when you said leader driven work, I, I I couldn't take my mind uh, off of that. Which it, it, like Letitia, help me understand. So when you say leader driven, that means that someone comes in, they take charge, they start uh, initiating change, but once they're gone it's gone, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's the, that is, a, that is the, that is, you know, it's great when you're there and you're able to kind of get through and, you know, muscle it through the system, but, you know, the, the challenge is building it into the, your organization in such a way that it's not dependent on a person. It becomes the, the, it's like, you know, we back in the day when I was working on, you know, it's like you want the healthy choice to be the default, right? You want that to be the default, not these other options. That's how you help create the changes that the default is to address equity. That's what we want. We want to be able to have that be part of what we do all the time. And it, it audience going to get tired of me saying the same thing over and over again. But it, it, it's a, another tie into the fact that it's not a sideshow. We don't need someone to just be, oh, that's that, that, that one health equity person. Yes. It needs to be integrated into that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about repeating myself, but like <gasps> your words were too good. Your words were too good. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the playbook, the playbook itself, it, it got really specific in, in some things that I, in, in some ways that I like. Of course, that like it's the specifics it used is a reflection of a long history of uh, starts and, and wins and things like that uh, within SDOH. But one thing that, that really caught my eye is that they're calling for Medicaid funding to address upstream issues, really specific into like heating and air quality and environmental aspects, among other things, like directly in patients' homes and lives. Can you paint a story, can you paint a picture? Like, like we can all see how like, especially in these winter months that we're in right now, especially I'm in Detroit and we, we feel it, we feel the cold. And I know that there's a major health impact in, in addressing the, in that, but how does that look in practice and at scale for, for, for some of these organizations? Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, you know, to do this work and I, I, I've said this already once, but I'm going to say it again, you know, to do this work, you have to be able to know who you're serving. So, you know, emphasis, and this is also emphasized in the playbook around data collection. We, we, it's critical that we have systems in place that are effectively collecting, collecting, um, you know, the data that we need to understand who we're serving. So that's the first step. And then, you know, then we need to screen, uh, you know, for health related social needs, but in order to, you know, to, to do the screening process, we have to build those relationships with the organizations that are, um, that are serving, um, serving these, you know, providing food, providing housing, um, and, and those supports. So, you know, in order to scale this work again, it, you know, the, the, if there was one word I would, you know, just underline today is that we need to build the infrastructure to support it. And so in order to have that infrastructure, that infrastructure has to have, um, systems of, of, uh, connectivity between community-based organizations and the healthcare organizations. We need to understand what, 
um, impact our interventions are making, and we need to you know connect the dots. And so I think that um, that is it, that infrastructure supports scalability because one partnership, one relationship, you know, one of the examples, and this is a great program, which I loved, you know, we did a food as medicine program um, at Cook County with the Greater Food Depository. And so it was an excellent program. It is an excellent program. It still exists. And um, a colleague of mine um, built that program uh, in partnership with the with the foundation, with our leadership. And, and that program essentially brought fresh fruits and vegetables to the clinic. So essentially, uh, a, a physician could write a prescription for um, food for a, a patient, and then the patient could go and they'd get fresh fruits and vegetables um, on Tuesdays every other week and and be able to get those fr fresh fruits and vegetables. And so that's a great program. It is really you know excellent in that we brought fresh fruits and vegetables into food desert areas in the community. And that intervention is still something that needs to be in place. But also, you know, that was funded, you know, just to note, that's funded by a private funder, right? Like that was funded by a philanthropy. And so, you know, that is a great program. But now we're moving to the next level, which is in the Medicaid program, you can identify a population that um, has a need and you can have medically tailored meals funded through the Medicaid program to support that population and have those delivered, right? And so that's an example of moving from, you know, and again, both of them are necessary and important. So having that more larger kind of population health intervention of coming into the community with fresh fruits and vegetables, and also having a Medicaid benefit to help provide uh, medically tailored meals. And arguably, you know, the third piece of that kind of strategy would be advocating for a, a grocery store within the community, right? So, you know, bringing together that, um, you know, I always, I love the, um, you know, kind of the public health model of layering our interventions and understanding that like policy, the system and individual um, strategies come aligning those together so that you can have transformation of health and communities. So uh, one thing that was really powerful, like you actually summarized a lot of uh, what, uh, what the playbook was saying, but especially like it started with the data element and uh, you addressed that infrastructure perspective too. There's one thing that I'm I'm really curious about. Like we've had conversations and and, and just seen it in action, where uh, like before we get the data, we have to collect it. We have to ask people questions or understand what their needs are. And I wonder about when understanding who might need those uh, food bank uh, uh, services from the food bank or other types of interventions uh, that that were work that that you would that that you'd be enacting. I wonder about that that collection aspect. About um, are there stories or, or, or concepts in terms of like, hey, here here's how we go out and uh, understand our communities and provide them the psychological safety to communicate the truth about what their needs are. Yeah, that's a really uh, that's a really great point. I think there's a couple of things there I, I want to mention. It you know one. There's a, a, a large movement around supporting the development of a community workforce that's that's to work in partnership with healthcare. And that, you know, community workforce includes, you know, folks like community health workers, um, doulas, um, you know, home visitors, uh, it includes uh, peer recovery support specialists and uh, people with lived experience who are providing supports. You know, there's a there's a real need for us to be able to build the capacity of having a workforce that is already a trusted uh, partner or trusted uh, member of the community to help us to effectively um, engage and to collect that data. I think that's that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, the other piece is that we have to also do a good, better job of being transparent you know, to our communities of why we're doing this and what the purpose is and show that we're leveraging, the, you know, all of that knowledge to be able to actually catalyze change and to provide the services that we need. So I think that um, those are two things that we need to do to kind of build that trust. And then the third piece of this is that, you know, similar to any policy change, you know, in the healthcare system, 
it requires a change management process. And so I think a lot of people, you're like, oh, you know, we tried to collect this data and like nobody wanted to do it. And, you know, they said that they, it was really hard to ask these questions. And we hear, you know, we hear that all the time, even though they're doing screening tools that ask a lot more intimate questions, you know, um, but we, you know, we get this all the time. And so the the thing that needs to happen is there, there has to be a, a change management process to to be able to partner with your improved data collection processes. And so that means that we, we need to provide education to the people who are collecting the data, share why we're collecting it, understanding how to collect that data in a sensitive way um, to make sure that they're um, understanding even the different uh, identities that are that we're looking to identify and, and why it's important. And so I think those change management processes, and that takes some work to be able to build that into your data collection strategy. But a data collection, you know, just to tell everybody to collect the data, hey, everybody, we're collecting it. Now it's going to appear on your, your workflow isn't going to get you good data. And it's not going to get you the data that, you know, you're not going to get the adoption of the collection of data like you you would like. You know, uh, you're, you're, you're flaring up the audience. I, I see a comment coming in that's related to that about timing and responsiveness of data collection. Uh, I, I think that that uh, like all of this plays a role in, I'm going to mention Vive again, because I was there last week and, and someone had said that your data and innovation can only move at the speed of trust. Yes. So by, it's, yeah, yes. So by, by talking about the community health worker and their relationship, we take data away from being something that's just sequestered into an IT department. Mm -hmm. And we acknowledge the relationship that everybody has, uh, that everybody's playing a role in the collection and action on this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a second point that I want to make, and I hope that we don't edit it out of this episode or anything like that, but I'm going to make this point. And it's going to surprise everyone. Letitia, this is this is Letitia's first podcast, and we didn't rehearse <laughs> that question. Okay, I'm just just letting you know what you're working with. Like first podcast, unrehearsed. Thank you so much. It's incredible, incredible. So just uh, going in deeper, this is this is asking a pull from the state policy experience that you have, the health system leadership experience that you have, because we know that this has been. Uh, forming some some really powerful, unique perspectives that I think are uh, adding value to our, to our audience. Thank you, Stephen, uh, from, from Get Well for, for, for speaking up on that too. So the, the playbook, as we've been discussing, it calls for interoperable data sharing with social determinants of health. As a data scientist, I, I watch people get burned with the politics and uh, specific permissions and things like that around the data. How, how can we make sure that like, how can, how can we make this work among all the different stakeholders that we're involving? Because it, it, we know that there, there's a, there's a, everybody who's, who's paying attention to the news with change health right now knows the importance of privacy and, and security, but uh, they're like, I, I hope it's not playing at odds with, with the need to involve multiple stakeholders in relevant parts of that patient journey. Can you talk about how, uh, how we make this thing work amongst uh, multiple stakeholders? Well, very much preserving the important privacy of uh, patient information and relationships. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really great question. I think, you know, we have some examples of uh, efforts that, you know, are have been successful around kind of what, you know, the community information exchange model, which, um, you know, was really catalyzed in San Diego, um, which, you know, created a platform which was, you know, really started out um, by um, the work that they were doing around addressing um, people who have been uh, who have been you know, not effectively connected to services who have been with who have been engaged in the justice, behavioral health, and um, healthcare system, and so they started that work out in, in San Diego to build this community information exchange to bring together kind of information from community partners as well as healthcare and the criminal justice system to kind of identify and to better engage individuals to link them to the services that they need. And so that model, I think, across the country is you know kind of getting um, uh, stakeholder engagement in Illinois. That's also uh, happening in the Cook County area where they're contemplating you know how that would work. And and uh, and really engaging on that, but I think the counter. The, so so yes, I think that there's opportunity, and I think that in order for us to build the durability and the infrastructure needed for this 
work to address social determinants of health and health related social needs, we need to have those infrastructures in place. At the same time, we really need to ensure that those systems are abiding by um, all of the HIPAA and all of the protections that we need for um, the healthcare data that we have. Um, and we also have to make sure that we're all communicating um, what to the individual who's participating in these systems how their data is being used, having transparency about that, and ensuring that we are getting permission to use that data. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of, there's been work, other work around the country about master person index work and all this other stuff that, where it often gets stalled in that um, data security and uh, piece. Um, but I think that um, it's still work that needs to be done and we still, it's still imperfect. And, you know, Chris, I think I waited maybe two years for one of my projects for a data use agreement to be signed. So I get the mm -hmm. pain uh, it takes to get those data use agreements uh, through our systems. Um, but I think that uh, it doesn't mean because it's hard and because it's complicated doesn't mean we shouldn't still try to be making it work and building those infra that infrastructure to do this work because um, because you know as someone who's sat in a room you know with twelve case managers in the housing sector who are you know trying to manage you know and and place you know twenty people into housing and see, seeing how I was like you know seeing that um, and then you know being like oh my goodness like what if we just connected them to our care coordination unit so that we could help better understand the the needs of those individuals to then get them quickly placed into the housing they need. And so that's an example of how, you know, I think we can build better systems to help, you know, all of us to be able to be ready to serve people where they are and more efficiently. That's a, a really powerful uh, way, way to make the point too. Um, I would say that like if we're talking about it, like heavily, heavily in your answer was in, ingrained the, the, the concept of trust and trust is something that very clearly uh, needs to be earned. So uh, if, if we're not enacting the, those, those types of policies and at, I mean, at the very minimum, uh, uh, like, like complying with, with regulations, then we're not earning that trust. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot that people are saying right now, or no, no, there's a lot that people have been saying for the past 15 years about big data but the the like, like big data that just is the the idea that that was pitched to a lot of people is like collect everything that you can store it in uh various data lakes and and, and what have you and figure out the value uh, uh afterwards but we're more and more moving especially in healthcare this is absolutely necessary in, uh, thinking in healthcare is not thinking about getting as much data as possible but understanding why you're collecting so, uh, why you're collecting said data being able to communicate that reason back, like you emphasize to that to, uh, to the patient, because there, there's there's just no reason to be uh, collecting every little thing uh, possible when there's no feedback for that patient. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's the, you know that model is pretty strong within kind of care coordination operations where you know people have to you know consent for um, for their data to be used for that purpose, and and you know I've seen a lot of uh, you know, consents that are pretty clear about what to what, at, you know, why are we doing this? Because, because we're trying to connect, you know, if, if you are eligible for a housing resource, we want to connect you to that resource. And so I think being really clear about that will help us to be able to get the data that we need and be able to, um, help, and, you know, the outcome, but we have to deliver the outcome so we can collect the data, but we need to start delivering those outcomes about timely connectivity to the resource that people need. And that will also help us build the trust that we need because, you know, we collect all this data and then we're like, well, you know, we don't have housing. So we'll talk to you in six months. Well, I mean, that's not helpful. So I think we need to continue not, not to say that that's what always happens, but sometimes it does. And, um, and I think that's what we need to continue to build is, um, you know, that, that, that value proposition, both to the, to the person, um, and to the community of why we, this is important. Well, you know, something that's coming in uh, as well too, like like kind of flipping from that data com uh, conversation, is that like data, like data sciences. I would say that that was kind of my strong suite when reading through the playbook, but reading about the backbone organizations was my weak suite. So I'm seeing a question coming in from uh, Natrina Kennedy, who is the founder and CEO of uh, the Women's Health Initiative uh, in Chicago, and her question is around how can 
can, how how can CBOs, which uh, refers to, to uh, community based organizations, how can CBOs? And I, the, the, I know the document was very emphatic about that. How can they get, uh, get involved to bring the playbook to life, uh, especially with challenges around funding and and support? Uh, do, do you have thoughts on uh, that that backbone CBO uh, model and, and and what is enabled or even coming down the line to provide? opportunities to the patients and, and members that they have access to? So there's a couple things. I think um, there's a lot of opportunity for CBOs to to engage and to uh, realize the value of the playbook. And I think that, um, you know, we often, a lot of folks will, will say, okay, you know, a, a one example is like, uh, creating uh, value-based agreements with community-based organizations around providing services for certain populations. And so, you know, that, so it's thinking about, okay, well, we provide, you know, this service and and what is the value to a health plan for this service to be connected to their, the people they serve. Um, and so in, in, in a lot of our environments, we're seeing these one-off conversations with one health plan, one organization who's then linking the resources to um, to those patients. And I think moving to that backbone uh, organization provides an opportunity for there to be a, a platform for community-based organizations to together engage with multiple health plans to be able to then have conversations about what they have to offer to be able to bring to the table um, to health plans. And so the waiver work that's happening is a lot is is helping to foster kind of that stakeholder engagement component to learn about um, what is it that the, what are the service pro, uh, areas that you do provide. So I think I would advise to a community based organization to think about what is it that you do. And I was actually talking to a client earlier today around, you know, OK, so you have you know in your organization this organization had community health workers. And so uh, they're like, we have community health workers, but we've had them grant funded. So we had one here, we had some here, we had some over here and they've been grant funded. So we used to have 10, you know, and now we have less. And so we talked about in, in, our, in Illinois, there's going to be a Medicaid payment uh, mechanism for community health workers in the coming years. And so we talked about, okay, well, you know, what what is the focus of your community health workers? What is their job description? How could they potentially be funded by the Medicaid program going forward? How do we understand what you've already done and what your expertise is so that when the opportunity to have funding for um, CHWs through a source like Medicaid, okay, what are you ready? So, okay, do you have, uh, are you, you know, can you provide, can you become a Medicaid provider? Um, what would be, how would you build that infrastructure for billing? You know, thinking through all of those steps. Um, and so it's really, I think for CBOs assessing kind of what do you offer, thinking about how that could connect to um, the potential um, kind of funding through the Medicaid program. And then, um, and then, you know, coming to those backbone organizations that are doing this work. So there's multiple uh, collaboratives in, in the state of Illinois and across the country that are building kind of these CBO networks. New York is an example where they're coming up with hubs. Um, so maybe uh, the individual CBO doesn't have to become a Medicaid provider, but they come into a network and then they can get payment through the network instead. Um, and so there's lots of models that are popping up. But the key thing here is that you know, you as a, a community-based organization, you know, distilling kind of what is it that you do that could be funded through these new funding opportunities, and then um, how do you build the relationships you need to then uh, have that sustainability. So knowing though that there's op there's a, uh, infrastructure that still needs to be built, um, that's the first step that I would take is what are you how what how your services could be connected in to what the waivers and the other uh, Medicaid programs are are seeking to have partnerships on. You know, I, I, I love that answer, and it starts begging a question because you, you're you're talking about the actions that CBOs can start taking uh, to to uh, get on that radar. But I wonder also if we flip the question around, uh, is there like when when we look at the health plans and and uh, like large funding bodies, their perspectives. Are there uh, things that they're missing out on? Or are, there, are there different ways or calls for leaders within those organizations to be uh, targeted and specific in, in looking at the last mile problems that these CBOs may be able to, so uh, to, to solve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, the, you know, this is, uh, so you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, that uh, 
change happens at the trust of at the tr at the speed of trust, right? And you know, I, there was a organization um, we were on a panel at a conference last year, and you know, he talked about you know, and he is a provider of. Uh, he's a, he works in a food bank and provides meals to medically tailored meals and he's in California. And so he had started to build the infrastructure before, you know, Kelly moved forward with the benefit. And so, um, you know, he, um, you know, but he talked about that there was a significant amount of investment that had to go in to be able to then realize the benefit of, uh, receiving funding. And so I think that, um, but he talked about all the relationships that he built and, you know, talking to folks. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that comes in, uh, on, uh, the community based provider, but I think an ideal situation is that we have, uh, CBOs who are able to kind of leverage, uh, to come together to then leverage conversations with the health plans. And then health plans have to really come to the table with an openness and uh, a willingness to be able to have uh, trusted relationships with those CBOs. Because I think that the idea of a transactional relationship that's just simply, you know, one to one uh, with our community based organizations, you know, will not is, in, is insufficient. And I think that um, at times, you know, health plans may come to these conversations and these uh, these partnerships with a subcontractor relationship in mind. And while it may end up being that they are on contract with the um, CBO to provide certain services, um, that relationship is critical to be deeper than just a transactional um, subcontract relationship in order to effectively um, have communication, to have continuous quality improvement, and to be able to ensure that um, you're um, getting the data you need to be able to demonstrate the value of the engagement with uh, that organization. Excellent. So yeah, that, that, that does give a great perspective on uh, tuning the radar, but also uh, engaging in good faith conversations that, that are designed to be, I said conversation, relationships that are designed to be fruitful and grow. Absolutely. So uh, uh, one, one big thing that we're, we're, so we're talking about a lot of the uh, data sharing um, and, and various practices that, that we want to enable. Do you see, like, like you, you've, you've talked about a, a, a lot of different models so far from an innovation perspective, that could be technological, that could be strategic, but what's on the horizon to help people uh, uh, better their care based on people's overall life conditions. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there there's a couple things. I mean, these are I I don't know that I would call them you know innovations per se, but I think there's a couple things that I think are critical as we go forward. And you know, one is that we have to really solution with the people we're serving. We have to have you know human centered design and really be co creating with. Uh, creating solutions with our partners in that way. And um, I think that that is not easy all the time, but I think it's critical for us to be able to create solutions and interventions that are going to be effective. And I also think that that helps with the durability and sustainability of the work going forward. Because as we do this work, if it's, again, if it's, you know, uh, one person, one organization, you know, it doesn't have that durability. And I think that really building, uh, you know, buy-in from a community and from the people that are served around an approach and a, a intervention can really help to, to sustain the work over time. Um, we also, there's a lot of things around value-based care. So, you know, really thinking about how are we delivering um, and addressing the needs of the whole person through a value-based model. Um, and that's another way that uh, CBOs can be engaged, um, not just through um, direct fee-for-service payment, um, but by demonstrating a value proposition. Um, the other thing is building and fostering the community workforce we need to do this work because, you know, we have a we have a lot of really great healthcare professionals, a lot of great folks who are in the healthcare system. And that's great. But for us to be able to take this work to the next level to really truly address health related social needs, we need a community facing workforce that looks like the people we, you know, we're serving that, um, you know, understands the communities that we're serving and can really be the frontline staff um, and folks who are engaging to help understand the needs and to help 
uh, help connect people with the resources they need. And so, like I mentioned before, those are the community health workers, the uh, peer recovery support specialists, peers, um, doulas, all of those folks, we really have to build them into, uh, into kind of how we're approaching this work. And so it doesn't mean that they should become a healthcare professional within a healthcare organization. It could be that they're in a CBO, um, but partnering with healthcare to help ensure connectivity to those um, health-related social need resources. So yeah, that, that that's myriad detail in in terms of not just the the technological front, which honestly, like being uh, at Wobot, we of we, we of course are excited about that aspect too. But uh, we're having a debate on LinkedIn uh, recently where it was a question of does innovation just encompass technology, and what we arrived at is that rather than focusing on buying the latest tech, it should be hey, uh, there, there's some strategies that we want to do. We want to improve the experience for patients or we want to drive access or even uh, uh, reduce costs or grow revenue. But those are the overall strategies. And, and there are often scenarios where technology or policy process changes can support those strategies. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly right on. Because even within the community workforce, like there, we could have enabling technologies that help them to be more effective for sure. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, work around the closed loop referral systems and those kind of, you know, um, data systems. And I think there's a lot there, but, you know, what we've learned in implementation around those, uh, those systems is that you still need the person, like you still need a person, you know, to, 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 to be, the one who's implementing um, those systems. And so that's the piece that sometimes gets left out because I think the pandemic, if it taught us nothing else, you know, we need people who are from our communities to be, um, to be engaged, to help us to do, you know, to do what we need to do and connect people to the resources they need. It, it's not, you know, a government entity and a hospital or a, a large health system, you know, they're not, the best position to do those things and to connect with the community in the ways that we need to. But uh, these positions and roles of uh, community workforce, um, I think can really, really help us to, to, to help be the glue within all of these pieces. So I'm going to tell everybody why I'm the worst host, actually. Uh, so I'm the worst host because I didn't realize that we had gone over our time. <laughs> then I realized it. I put in the chat, oh, no, I'm sorry that we're over time. And then I forgot again because it's so engrossed in your answer that I, uh, yeah. So sadly, we, but we still, we ha still have a little bit of time left and uh, there is a big elephant in the room type question that I want to get, that, that I want to get out. Hopefully it's received well, but uh, the, 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 the big question that I might have uh, rolling into it is, okay, so this, this playbook came from the white house in 2023, but by the end of 2024, we might have a different White House. So why, when is the right time for me to invest or start rethinking my health equity initiatives? Yeah, so uh, do not rethink your health equity in, uh, investments. I think at the end of the day, here's, here's the bottom line. I, I've said this already once, I'm gonna say it again. It is the job of healthcare to deliver high quality care and to improve health outcomes. That is what our health system should be delivering. And the strategies around addressing equity should be embedded into your quality uh, uh, quality uh, systems of your organization and should be part of your business model. And it doesn't matter what, you know, the, 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 this work happen, has happened over the last 50 years, whether or not it had the infrastructure and the support of the federal government, you know, that, that was not there. Um, will that maybe go away? I don't know. But all I know is that if you have, built this into your quality strategy and into your business, this, there's no question. It is our job to do this. And so if we decide that we are not going to serve a certain population, we're not doing our job. And so my argument is that if anything else, this work becomes more important if the administration changes and, and we must continue these investments. And we have to make sure that we're showing the outcomes and impact of all of this work. That's exactly the point. That is exactly the right point to be making is that this is not a drop in the bucket that just happened in November. No. 50 years in the making. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, from the affordable care, I mean, before the affordable care, actually, in fact, this all, all addressing disparities started with the EHR, the creation of the EHR was understanding the disparities of care. That was part of that, you know, which is, you know, many, many years ago. So, so this is not one administration's outcomes. This is multiple. And, and I think that we have to continue this work, um, regardless of our, of the politics of our state, you know, or at the federal level. So we're, we're coming close. We're coming close. And uh, also I, I do have to sh put out a word of appreciation to a lot of people that developed some of the standards and guidelines around that EHR Absolutely. usage, because th it, it were, there were conversations in the room that had to happen for things like race and ethnicity to yeah. even be included. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Melanie Wasserman, was actually involved in that conversation. Uh, but we're coming, we're coming close to that magic wand time. Anybody who has been uh, following Meeting the Minds knows that, uh, that we have imaginary superpowers here. And one of those is to change one aspect of how healthcare is delivered. So we hand that superpower over to you, Letitia. What do you do with the power to change one aspect, magically change one aspect of how healthcare is delivered? Yeah. So I thought a lot about this and, and, uh, I, I actually, you know, I, I'm going to change the question a bit. I'm going to tell, so, cause here's the thing, like if I, I have so many things that I would want to change in healthcare, but what I think we, my wish actually is that the change makers and the folks who are carrying the water around addressing equity, get the resources they need. They have the leadership buy-in for the work that they're doing and that they can continue to be on the front lines to ensure that equitable health care is provided in their communities, specifically addressing the communities who are underserved. Because this work is happening. People were doing it before it was in this playbook and they're going to keep doing it. And I want to help you know, them to ha remove the barriers, get the resources they need and to, to be able to do the work. And quite frankly, that's what I, that's my job, right? Is to partner with all those folks across the country and help them to build the business strategies and build the infrastructure in their organization. So this work has durability by beyond their tenure. And so that's the wish I have is that they have what they need to keep doing the work because it's not going to change in one year. It didn't happen in one, this, we didn't get to here in one year. It's not going to be fixed in a year. It's going to be fixed over our next 20 years. And we need people out there who are just as passionate as I am on the front line doing the work. You know, getting realistic about it and uh, talking about that, that durability of leadership, uh, the, real, the reality gives more hope than, than if you were to talk about some magic. So uh, thank you uh, for, for the way that you, you, you took that one. Awesome. Let's, thank you. It's, it's that time. It's that like y'all, we, we stay over because we care. We, we, th this is an ex extremely important topic. And I, I really appreciate that there's a significant number of people still with us here. Uh, for the people that want to keep following this conversation and, and, and follow your ex excellent guidance and thoughts on uh, how to move forward in the SDOH landscape that we're forming, what's the best way for people to keep in touch or keep, in tr keep track of you? Yeah. You know what? Uh, you know what? Please friend me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect and I'm happy to, you know, talk to folks offline. Um, that's the quickest way. Um, and of course, uh, you know, if you Google me, you'll find all of my, my contact <laughs> information um, at HMA and I would love to talk. I, again, I'm passionate about this work and I also, you know, I, my, my goal is to be alongside to help amplify uh, the work that leaders are doing all across the country and bring these strategies to life into operation and to, to build long-term sustainability into business strategies to deliver the outcomes that we need around improved healthcare and high and delivering high quality care. So uh, I would love to connect with you all. And I appreciate folks uh, for joining today. This is my first podcast. So I'm super excited mm -hmm. to have that under my belt. Nobody's going to, nobody watching is going to believe that it was your first podcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is too good. It was too good. And I, I, I got to say that this is social networking. We got the social part. We're talking. Let's put the networking part into it too. So yeah. uh, follow Letitia. If somebody said something that you agree with and you really endorse, go ahead and follow them too. This is the, the networking yeah. part of the social network happening on Meeting of the Minds for you. Let's say, I, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for, for uh, taking 
uh, some of your time to plan this discussion with us and uh, then execute so well. Um, for the audience, thank you so much for, for joining us today. This is an extremely important topic and I'm, I'm glad that it's not treated as a niche issue. This is one of the largest uh, showings that we've had and it, it, it really gives a lot of heart. I hope it gives everybody watching a lot of heart too, to know, to look at those numbers and see how many people are engaging with this. But today we covered this big umbrella federal view, but also we were talked about those frontline perspectives and what we're hearing from community health workers. I want to throw you to towards something that can give you more of a frontline view as well. So there's a psychiatrist, Dr. Roshni Kali, who is currently serving as the chief medical officer of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, but she's still practicing psych uh, psychiatry as well. We sat down with her to talk about the challenges and patient sensitivities involved in collecting social determinants of health data and uh, in enacting SDOH initiatives. So that conversation, if you're watching on YouTube, that should be popping up on your screen. And if you're not, you can just search truths and limitations of SDOH data, and that video uh, should pop up for you. So again, thank you very much for another Meeting of the Minds, and we will see you next time.